Okay, well, thank you all for taking the time to meet with us today. And uh, definitely today's topic I'm very passionate about is uh, aligning sales and marketing teams, because clearly the two teams that make a, I think the biggest impact on all of our businesses is really the the, the sales and marketing teams. And uh, definitely marketing and sales are, uh, I would say, arguably quite different. And uh, uh, these two teams, their thinking is different and also, uh, what they're doing is clearly different and alignment, I, I, I argue, is one of the more important strate strategic decisions that we can make as companies is to really focus on getting these two teams to uh, work together. So today, again, I'm going to share some some uh, concepts with you. Uh, I'm Hopefully, we're going to get to a, a short uh, walkthrough of both of our software on, on the call today. But really, the intent of this call is to try to give you some insights into uh, how to better align your sales and our marketing organizations. Now, let's face it, these two teams are focused on one thing. And that one thing is uh, accelerating buyer journeys. Right, it's a case that uh, we're all in business. We have products and services that we're trying to uh, uh, help clients or people solve problems with, and uh, it's a case that the two teams that we have in house to accelerate the buying process and uh, help people who actually do have a fit with our products and services uh, come to the conclusion that what it is that we're offering uh, will help solve the problems they have. So there's definitely a buyer journey, and the buyer journey is contained within uh, uh, two, I would say, funnels. One is the sales funnel, the other one is the marketing funnel, and uh, we have two teams that are uh, responsible for uh, helping these prospects through different parts of the buyer journey. So, they, And I argue that both of these teams have unique challenges, and I think it's important to understand uh, these challenges uh, so that we can better align align the teams. And clearly, if these two teams are working together, the person that wins, of course, the company wins, but I think it's uh, more important to understand that the, the, the prospect wins as well. So first, I want to talk about... Uh, Product, like I said, we're we're all in the business of selling something, like right? product or service. We have something that we're offering our clients. Now, when we're thinking about sales and marketing, I think it's also to think uh, it's important to understand how our offering relates to sales and marketing. So, in this graph here, you're seeing on the bottom uh, is time to value, and what I mean by that is when somebody buys something from you. Uh, how long does it take the client to fully realize the value uh, that they're hoping to get out of the system, right? And uh, the, the other, gra other uh, axis on this is uh, how much, uh, you know, what's the complexity of the offering that you have? Uh, is it the case that they just buy the product, buy whatever it is you have, and it's going to be what it is and throughout the entire value realization process or time, I should say? Or is it the case that uh, the, the, you're going to have to do a bunch of work to uh, help the client realize the value by changing the product in, in specific ways that align with what their needs are? So really, there's this transition, I would say, from complexity where in the bottom uh, left corner, we have discrete products, and then up in the top right corner, we have platforms. And uh, there's actually an impact on sales and marketing, depending on where your product fits in this graph. So if we go to the bottom, uh, the bottom left side where we have discrete products, the product is well defined, they purchase it, it isn't going to change uh, after they bought. Uh, Clearly, this is a situation where marketing can take a much bigger role through the buyer journey, right? So it's really just pushing people towards the sales organization and the sales organization. I wouldn't say that, you know, I would say on the extreme side, they are order takers. Like if you think about Apple, uh, you buy an iPad, that iPad's going to be what it is when you buy it. And it's a case is going to continue being what it is as you use it. And uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we think about an ERP system, right? Like SAP, uh, arguably SAP doesn't exist until you've spent uh, your entire, uh, I would say uh, 3X budget you had allocated for implementing the ERP. It doesn't exist until well after that's been spent. 
So uh, clearly there's a, a, a large difference in these two ends of the spectrum. And if you think about the discrete product, Apple's marketing is, hey, you know, they do all the work and then you walk into the store and that person, do you want the, thir you know, the, the 32, you want it in gray or do you want it in white? So that's really the, the sales process. So it's important to understand here. And also when, if you think about uh, with SAP, right? We've all seen these back when we could travel, uh, these advertisements for SAP is like Porsche uses SAP. That's, you know, it's really about brand awareness and then there's a big consultative sales process. So I think it's important to understand this and how it relates to your company. Because if there's a misalignment, for example, if you have a, uh, a uh, complex product and you're really hiring uh, sales folks as order takers and you think marketing is going to do the entire Tire job, or if you have a discrete product and you just hire salespeople and you say, hey, go out there and get some business, I think there's going to be clearly a, a, an alignment issue. So I think it's important to understand how this relates uh, with what it is that you're offering, because if you get the alignment, I should say, the the strategy right as far as where, how much of the, uh, how far the ball is going to be carried by marketing and what it looks like when we pass it to sales, you're in a good spot to uh, get your two teams aligned. So really the takeaway here is business goals. And uh, I think it's a case that as companies, we have to understand the uh, complexity of our offering and specifically how it relates to our sales and marketing teams and that we're hiring the right, uh, have the right staff uh, that are tasked with, I guess, the right job. I think this is the, before we even talk about alignment, I think it's important to have this, this in place. Now, uh, arguably, we have to understand, like, uh, as marketers, and uh, uh, we we all know our, our challenges, and the salespeople, they have challenges. And I think it's a case that there's a bit of education that needs to be done where the two different teams understand the challenges that uh, that they they uniquely face. Because if they understand what, uh, if I'm in marketing and I truly understand what the sales challenges are, and if I'm in sales and I truly understand the marketing challenges, because we're people, uh, I think it's, uh, it, it'll help with the, the, uh, the marketing and sales alignment. So if we look at the marketing challenges today, clearly marketing is uh, boots in the ground. Marketing isn't uh, isn't isn't a strategy. Uh, it's a case that uh, we're doing digital marketing, and arguably the biggest challenge that all digital marketers face is building trust. Right? It's the case that. Uh, uh, arguably, buyers today are more, uh, uh, there's more anxiety and apprehension as far as trusting anything that they see uh, on the web, right? Uh, so it's a case that the, this is what marketers are faced with as they're trying to engage with a population of people that are very, very, very leery of uh, uh, anything that they see uh, online, right? Uh, another challenge that uh, the marketing teams face is that uh, clearly, no matter what product or service we're selling, we were we will be selling to different uh, buyer personas, right? There's different uh, buyer profiles that uh, that marketers have to target, and uh, definitely there's a lot of different strategies. There's uh, uh, lots of different things that they'll try to, uh, uh, I guess, uh, engage with these buyer profiles. But all marketing teams are faced with this, with limited resources and limited budgets, right? And I hear this so often is that whether a marketer is working for an agency or in-house marketers is that uh, all marketers are faced with constantly having to prove their worth, so to speak. And what I mean by that is, is that uh, quite often marketing, uh, it's hard to, it's easy to deliver value. It's difficult to communicate to internal constituents what that value is. I have marketers constantly saying, you know, gee, you know, uh, I have to constantly fight for budget and, uh, you know, the salespeople think we're doing nothing, but uh, uh, we're, we're doing tons of stuff, right? So I think that this is a challenge that the marketers face. And all you salespeople on the phone, if you've got marketing teams, I think it's important to understand that, uh, you know, one is that the marketers are providing value and uh, to understand the, the problems that they, they, they are facing daily. And really, if we think about the <clears throat> what marketers' role is, I think it's uh, it's really about one thing, and uh, I think it's it's about making it easier to sell, 
right? That's the whole reason people spend money on marketing. It isn't to uh, arguably, you know, create content and uh, uh, make nice pretty pictures or whatever it is. It's all of it is really down to this. The whole role of marketing is, I think it's been succinctly uh, summarized here, is it's making it, uh, making it easier to sell. So on the sales side, we have uh, sales challenges. So as marketers, I think it's important to understand what uh, the world looks like, the challenges that the, mar the salespeople uh, face on a daily basis. And I think all salespeople, the number one thing that they, the uh, challenge that they all have is time, right? That's it. You know, it's a, you know, marketers fish with very large nets, so to speak, uh, whereas uh, sales is a contact sport. This is where salespeople are ta uh, talking to people, right? And uh, arguably, uh, all salespeople know this, uh, the Pareto principle is about uh, the 80-20 rule is 80% uh, of our uh, revenue comes from 20% of our activities. So all salespeople are constantly thinking about this, is that there's all this stuff that they're wasting time on, right? They're wasting time on, uh, you know, administrivia, uh, logging notes, uh, chasing the right pe wrong people, uh, chasing bad leads, spending way too much time on Seymours. In other words, these people that just want to see lots and uh, never want to uh, uh, buy anything, or maybe they getting people at the wrong time, et cetera. So there's a lot of time burglars, as I call them. So as marketers, uh, if we are thinking about the sales organization, if we're just thinking that really, how do we uh, optimize their time so that they are talking to the right people, they're talking to qualified leads, and uh, they're not wasting wasting their precious time. So I think that's important as marketers that we understand this. Now, definitely, uh, both sales and marketing are focusing on, again, accelerating buyer journeys right? Now, there's going to be multiple touch points. And quite often, it's a case that a lot of the research and work has been done before uh, marketing has actually introduced these people to sales, or that even the marketing is connected to these people. And if we know that there's a journey here, and we've got these two very separate teams that are focused on different parts of the, the buying process, uh, how do we maintain, maintain a consistent storyline and consistent messaging, uh, et cetera? Right, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's something we have to think about with the end in mind is it's the prospect's journey that we're trying to accelerate here. So uh, if we recognize that this journey is one, is there's uh, multiple entry points to the journey. In other words, not everybody starts at the top of the funnel and goes through the entire process. Uh, and we have to build uh, infrastructure and processes that allow prospects to come into the story uh, and uh, work efficiently. So it isn't the case that we say, oh, you know, you didn't come at the top of the funnel where you didn't know anything, so therefore we're going to drop the ball. We have to allow multiple entry points uh, and allow these prospects to, again, maintain a consistent story throughout the entire process. And I argue that <laughs> really all of us as, as sales and marketers, we're going to be using tools, right? Uh, that's what differentiates us from animals is <laughs> our ability to use tools. Uh, and it's a case that uh, uh, to help the prospects uh, through the buyer journey, we have to, of course, have well-targeted messaging, uh, well-timed communications and personalized engagement. It's a case that, uh, uh, you know, it's that's how we're going to maintain this consistent storyline throughout the entire journey. Now, <clears throat> to pull this off, uh, I argue that we really, as organizations for sales and marketing, we have a, a data problem, right? And, uh, uh, and why is that uh, if we look at the entire buying process, um, then we, I'm showing you here the funnel here is that uh, up at the top of the up at the top of the the funnel there's targeted accounts or prospects rather we have the engaged prospects and prospect accounts we have our opportunities or salespeople or engagement and then cross sell upsell and account penetration now all of these uh, throughout this buyer journey there's definitely uh, us as uh, organizations we're we're, we're we're, it's very important for us for the personalization and, and helping these people through the process is we have to have data that uh, we leverage and use uh, to, to accelerate this process. 
So at the very top of the funnel, arguably, our organizations have some form of uh, metadata or uh, descriptive data of our prospects and buying verticals. Now, some of it's shared by tribal knowledge. More sophisticated companies will actually do research and uh, maybe pay consultants or do the investigations themselves. And arguably, the systems that capture this data vary by the organization, whether it's in slide decks or uh, files, uh, PDFs, or in the CRM or marketing tools, what have you. A little bit further down the uh, process, clearly uh, it's not speculative. Now we're actually engaging with folks. So there's some uh, new data that we can actually leverage in, in this process, which is behavioral data. So definitely the research and metadata is all speculative. We're going to assume that uh, uh, this is still true, still relevant, and that it is accurate. But once we get behavioral data, prospects are actually engaging with us. Right, so we can actually, this is re, uh, uh, definitely a lot uh, fresher uh, information for us as organizations to use. So maybe the people are engaging on the websites, maybe they're engaging on chat, social platforms, et cetera. This is where people are actually taking actions and we're collecting these, uh, the data from these, uh, these actions in different systems, whether it's ad platforms, ERP, social platforms, uh, or analytics platforms, et cetera. And definitely now, once we're engaging with the prospects directly with our sales organization, and this is direct interaction, clearly this data is factual. In other words, unless, well, we can assume that all prospects are going to be upfront and honest with our with engagement. Um, and so really this information is absolutely the best for everybody, right? And typically this is being uh, captured by our salespeople in the CRMs, or maybe it's social software, phone software, all this type of stuff. Now, you see there's a lot of data. When I say we have a data problem, uh, what's typically the problem is we don't have a data strategy and we have no way of actually taking the accurate data and moving it back up the system so that we as marketers can have more accurate data at the top of the funnel and uh, do a much better job accelerating people through this process. Now, this problem is uh, quite complex in that uh, quite often we, as again, it's about tools, right? As people, uh, we are going to try to buy a bunch of tools to help us do our job. Now, on the marketing side of things, definitely there's a lot of different software people will buy to try to solve this problem, right? And uh, the problem with this picture is not, uh, even on the sales side, they're buying a lot of different tools. And the, really the problem with this picture is not software, it's actually what's missing. And what's missing is the prospect, right? Little pieces of the prospect are spread out amongst all the different tools and it be becomes very difficult for us to get this uh, data flow back into the organization. And we as marketers and as a company, we it's very difficult for us to understand what's working and what's not. And arguably back to the time burglars where everybody ends up wasting a lot of time trying to, uh, you know, understand uh, what is uh, what is the true buyer journey, et cetera. And without the buyer journey, we cannot accelerate it is, is the point of the story here. So the takeaway here is that uh, we need a data strategy as companies for sales and marketing alignment, because clearly marketing, if we're thinking about uh, making it easier to sell, we want better leads for our salespeople. We want our salespeople with better uh, uh, information. And on the prospect side, from a trust perspective, we want to be engaging again, consistently, right time, right message, et cetera. So we need a data strategy and we need a tech stack strategy, right? Uh, we need a way to uh, uh, make decisions on tools that allows the data to flow between uh, uh, the tools as well as through our two sales and marketing organizations. Now, uh, another part of this uh, story about uh, sales and marketing alignment is really about uh, people. Right, so again, us as companies, it's not just, uh, uh, they're not just, uh, you know, employee profiles, they're people, they're sales people. There's a sales organization, marketers, there's a marketing team, these are people, right? And uh, if we have our data and tool strategy uh, uh, in place and it's working, the reality is we have to work together as people. Right, and we don't want our two teams stepping on each other's feet. We have to understand that uh, 
uh, you know, where is the ownership of the prospect? What's the prospect? How are we engaging with the prospect? And we're not uh, sending mixed, mixed messages uh, uh, to the prospect, et cetera. So really, the, it's a case we have to have some alignment on uh, our two teams and have our two teams talking. And I argue there's a uh, great opportunities for collaboration, not just uh, on the marketing side, but during the buying process as well. Now, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and focus here more on the sales side of things and how uh, marketing can, uh, can assist during the, the, uh, the buying process while sales are engaged. So clearly, there's a sales funnel, and this is typically where our salespeople are engaged, and superimposed on the sales funnel is the marketing funnel. Now, uh, definitely marketing's role up here is to apply pressure to a large population of people to uh, get prospects to respond favorably and do something that indicates that they're ready for sales engagement. Now, uh, arguably this happens when uh, when marketing has done their job and the prospects do something, the prospect crosses this boundary here. And then we pass it off to the sales organization and the sales organization is project managing this prospect through uh, sort of the, the, last, the last part of the journey. Now, one of the things that marketing is really good at is, uh, is tracking prospect signals and measuring strategies based on those signals that prospects are doing. Uh, marketing says, okay, I need to get somebody to this, this landing page. I need this prospect to do this. I need the prospect to do, and everything that marketing does is based around arguably these signals and the strategies to get the prospects to do the signals. Now, interestingly enough, uh, on the sales side, uh, there's a bit of a, uh, it's it's definitely, I think all salespeople are aligned on the one signal that they want the prospects to do, and that is uh, they want them to buy, right? And within the CRM or within the organization, typically we have deal stages, right? And so we have this very clear action the prospect does here that marketing knows very well, and their, their strategy is aligned to get the prospect to do this. And there's this sort of this... Uh, this uh, blob here, so to speak, from the marketing perspective, and they just, okay, we passed it to sales, sales are doing their job, boy, I hope the prospect buys, right? And sales have a bunch of strategies, and at the end of the day, through all these deal, deal stages, the, the end goal is to get the prospect to buy, right? But arguably, um, you know, and I, I see this a lot in different companies is what they label these stages, uh, uh, you know, are typically nouns. Right, their uh, you know uh, their needs, their qualification, or uh, uh, quote, or something like that. Uh, arguably, the most important part of this diagram here are the barriers, the transaction. I should say the uh, the the state changes between these deal stages, and uh, and this again, I, I see lots of sales organizations where. This is not clearly defined. What is the action that the prospect is going to do that transitions them from deal stage one to deal stage two? What is the action the prospect is going to take when they transition from deal stage two to deal stage three? This one everybody knows, but typically it's not so well defined here. And I argue as sales organizations, you should actually define these actions, right? And we, my company, we actually changed the name of our deal stages to be these actions, right? So that yes, they've taken this action, therefore they're in deal stage one. Uh, they've taken this action, therefore they're in deal stage two. Then us as a sales organization, we know what strategies we need to uh, uh, execute on to get the prospect to move from this deal stage to this deal stage because of the well-defined action. Now, if these actions are well-defined, right, we can communicate these actions to marketing. 
right? And there's a fantastic role for marketing during this process. Because one of the things that marketing does, they're one, is they really understand this concept of getting prospects to do something. And typically marketing is fantastic at measuring uh, all of these specific state uh, transactions above this boundary. So if we define these actions, we can actually bring in the marketing team to, okay, I have a whole bunch of people in this deal stage. How do we as an organization move these prospects from here to here? So now we have talking points between these two teams where we're all as an organization focused on getting these people to take this explicit action to move to the next deal stage. So there's some great things that marketing can do here, whether it's, uh, you know, they can uh, uh, add, do targeted ads for people in stage one, or they can uh, do uh, sequencing or communication, change the website. There's lots of things that marketing can do uh, with the people in the different deal stages. And there's some great opportunity for the marketing and sales people to talk about the entire buyer journey from the perspective of signals or actions that prospects are taking, right? Because again, marketing is uh, so good at this and typically sales is not. And if, if we have these definitions, our two organizations have some nice talking points where they can work together to actually uh, move the people through the buying process. So really it's a case that once we have this dialogue, then again, marketing can start building promotions for people. Like quite often marketing is just thinking top of funnel, but here we can actually, this is where the data is the best. It's truly be uh, real factual data. Uh, we can either build dynamic content on our website. We can adjust our promotions. We can do sequencing and align the communications with automation. And definitely we can optimize our sales scripts and our sales strategies as a company to get people to again, move through these different uh, uh, state changes in the, in, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the in the sales funnel. So, and then of course with uh, marketing, marketing has got a, a fantastic, uh, all marketers are really about the data and analytics and understanding what's working and what's not. So it's a case that uh, uh, measurement, uh, the uh, salespeople, no salespeople want to spend a lot of time, you know, as uh, I, I argue as, uh, as engineers or data analysis, but definitely the marketing people are. So there's some great opportunities for uh, the marketing folks to assist the sales team uh, uh, with analytics and with true uh, uh, true stats about true people. And that's the, the benefit here too, is they can talk about actual buyer journeys in this process. So, and back to the challenge of uh, marketing, um, uh, you know, constantly having to prove their worth. Let me tell you, if you can save, you know, two hours of a salesperson's time on a daily basis, let me tell you, you're going to be their best friend, right? Uh, <laughs> they're going to love you for it. Right, and and if you come into it as as uh, with that attitude and that thinking of I just want to save you time, uh, you're going to have pe salespeople who are very very eager to uh, to listen and collaborate, right? Um, so really, the takeaway here is that uh, marketing doesn't stop at the lead opportunity boundary, right? And uh, this whole, you know, sales are uh, marketing and marketing's in Venus and sales are in Mars or whatever. We're one company, we're one team, and uh, the, there's a customer journey that's happening through this process. And as a team, we can work through the, the process, not just at the lead opportunity boundary, we can work as a team uh, during, the, uh, during the sales funnel, and definitely marketing can take this information that they learn of accelerating buyer, buyer journeys during the sales engagement and feed it back into the top of the funnel. So, and definitely automation. It's a case that uh, is a, a big part of this, uh, <clears throat> a big part of this whole story here. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about automation and I'm going to talk specifically about uh, the tech stacks uh, that uh, we're here, Active Demand and, and Nimble. And it'll talk about how these uh, two pieces of software uh, help marketing teams and help sales teams uh, better align and better accelerate uh, the sales journey. So I'll talk a little bit about the products, then I'm going to walk in and actually show you uh, some examples of how this process works. So back to this picture here. It's the, we have our sales funnel and we have our marketing funnel. And uh, 
from a very high perspective, again, there's the one of the more critical boundaries is the lead opportunity boundary. And I argue sales and marketing teams should, this is one of the most important parts of the uh, alignment between, between sales and marketing is actually discussing, and some companies actually do a contract here, is defining what it is that the prospect has to do to cross this boundary. Now, um, Active Demand, which is a marketing system, which I'll talk a little bit about here, it's a full stack marketing platform that uh, really it's the tool set used by marketers for applying pressure to a large population of people to, again, get somebody to cross this, this boundary here. It's the system of record for everybody that is not yet ready for sales engagement. And once somebody crosses this boundary and we pass it off to the sales organization and into, the, into Nimble, arguably at this point of the journey, the data master must become Nimble. And why I say that is, again, up here, it's inference assumption. Here, it's people that are talking to people. So once the, uh, the, the prospect crosses this boundary, from now on, the data master must become Nimble. And anything that happens in Nimble must be reflected into the, the marketing system. Now, uh, one of the questions that a lot of people might be asking is, well, okay, so now we have two pieces of software. We've narrowed it down from say 30 pieces of software to two. Why don't we just have one piece of software that, that does both, right? And, uh, uh, um, you know, it's, it's a good question. And I argue that uh, the biggest challenge that uh, all organizations have with respect to a CRM is getting salespeople to use it, right? And if it's a case, if that CRM isn't built to be absolutely, you know, a fantastic tool for salespeople, you're going to be having to use force to get these sales people to use it hence the word salesforce and uh, uh it's a case that uh so arguably it's a case that uh, you want to make a choice on a crm that is built from the ground up to solve that problem enhance the salesperson's uh sales the salesperson's uh processes and uh, arguably nimble has done that um yep. do you have any and, comments uh, on this yeah, Sean, I just wanted to provide another perspective on this as well. And, you know, uh, a lot of the, there are a lot of talks about being in the same ecosystem with, uh, you know, softwares like HubSpot and Salesforce and even Dynamics for that matter in the Microsoft world, uh, where you have the same ecosystem, but at the same time, you're getting an average of all the tools, you know, like HubSpot marketing is not as good as HubSpot sales or one part of the product is not good as the other. But when you get such a tight integration, which you have between nimble and active demand, you get the best of both worlds. You get the best in SMB CRM and you get the best in marketing automation with active demand. And thanks to our tight integration, you can do so much more and get your salespeople and your marketing people to engage even more with these tools than you will ever will with HubSpot or, Mark or Salesforce or any of the other tool because they're so hard to use and so complex. But this is just the best of both worlds and it's very simple to use in a CRM perspective and in a marketing automation perspective. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, to add to that is really, it's a case that uh, uh, they're, you know, marketers are, and salespeople, they are different groups of people with different challenges. Game okay, marketers are typically fishing with very large nets and uh, uh, salespeople are, t uh, it is a full contact sport. So they need a tool for engaging full contact. And uh, really, if the integration problem is solved, then, it's a case that uh, having specialized tools, there is a good case for it. And definitely with the integration we have with Nimble, it's a, it's a deep integration is the reality. And you'll see that uh, later on in the presentation here. Yeah. So really uh, active demand is, uh, like I said, is a tool set used by marketers for applying pressure to a large population of people with the intent of creating market qualified leads. And uh, really we, it's about the buyer journey, right? So active demand, tracks everything from first touch on the website through to cross sell upsell brand advocacy active demand is tracking everything and because we get the journey we can intelligently use tools to accelerate it we have a full social engagement stack full email marketing stack landing pages appointment scheduling and uh, automation and sequencing and calling and definitely the integration with uh, uh with nimble is 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 very deep so 
definitely we have a full stack of marketing tools with uh, active demand and a very deep integration with Nimble. We have uh, lots of automation capabilities for task automation, et cetera. And uh, I'll show you a little bit of that a little bit later here. Um, but I'll just pass things off and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, a little bit about Nimble. All right, perfect. Hey everyone, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, where you're wherever you're joining from. My name is Yajas. Uh, I'm the channel marketing coordinator here at Nimble. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about, you know, where Nimble fits into this uh, perspective and also in the CRM world. So in the world we live in currently, CRM and contact manage management tools, they don't really work for us. We work for them in a way. You know, you have seen platforms like Salesforce or HubSpot or even any other big CRM you use in the big firm. They always hire admins that are just taking care of that CRM. That's all they have to do. And that's exactly what I'm talking about is you start working for the CRM instead of it being the ideal world where you CRM starts working for you. And that's why most global businesses, which are small to medium sized businesses, they do not manage their relationships in a CRM. They do it in email, spreadsheets and social media. Yeah. And the problems with the traditional CRM are that, again, people manage their relationships in email, calendar and social, but none of these applications talk to each other. There's no integration between them. Uh, CRMs are also designed for reporting and not really for relationships. It's become more of a customer reporting management tool instead of a customer relationship management tool. And the number one cause of CRM failure is due to lack of use, due to limited value. You know, if, if a customer or a salesman doesn't see any value when using them, or any CRM for that matter, the most likely the reason is they just have limited value that they get from it. So that's what leads to the lack of use. And uh, it's also a very manual process. It's not automatic at all. You have to copy the name from you know, Google, paste it back into your CRM, do your own research, and you even struggle with data entry. And like Sean uh, alluded to earlier, where if you save a salesperson's time, you know, they'd be really thankful to you, which a CRM doesn't really help with. And uh, CRM also don't work with key business tools like QuickBooks, MailChimp, LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. Also Office 365 and G Suite, which are your email tools. And that's where Nimble exactly fits in. Nimble is not a traditional CRM. We're more of a, a CRM made for the SMB market and for being very simple. That's what we keep at the forefront of what we do. Uh, we work with all types of tools, including active demand, which is a very tight integration, like the ones we have with Office and G Suite and uh, QuickBooks as well. We are also one of the only CRMs that connect with social media tools and uh, try to keep it as user-friendly as possible and don't even uh, like we make changes to the features, but the usual interface is the same. You know, it's not like if you log into Nimble after two years, it's an unfamiliar platform, which is what's happening in the CRM world right now, where you log in and it's just a completely different platform. And if you relearn everything again, you'll never see that with Nimble. So that's just a little bit about Nimble. And I just hand it back to Sean now to okay. continue. Yeah, and the one thing that I uh, I, I know from uh, uh, Nimble is that again, it's it's about uh, back to the salesperson is that uh, the tool uh, has to add value so that it reduces time. And I think Nimble's done a fantastic job of that, is creating a nice, easy to use platform that salespeople like engaging with. So from an act, I'll just talk a little bit about active demand here, and uh, from a marketing perspective, then I'll talk about some of the integration, and I'll pass it back uh, to talk about Nimble. So active demand, again, it's a tool. So one of the most important parts of uh, of marketing is understanding what's working and what's not. So active demand has some fantastic reporting, and I, arguably one of the most powerful uh, parts of our platform is our dashboard tool. Uh, this is really the only part of the platform that is unique to the person who logs in. Each of the uh, marketers uh, and sometimes sales management, et cetera, uh, they can, we can build dashboards that uh, uh, align with the specific constituents. So for example, this is my dashboard, other people in the company, they have their dashboards. You can build them, save them, share them, assign them, et cetera. Now uh, we do all of our social content in the platform. So a calendar is a nice communication tool. These are the posts that uh, haven't been published yet. All of the sales meetings, SEO. We have lots of Kanban tools for slicing and dicing the database, not just contact Kanbans, account Kanbans, et cetera. And I'll just very quickly walk through the tools. We have a landing page tool. 
which is very powerful. All of our builders, all of our tools in our platform share a common builder. So it's really uh, easy to learn as a marketing organization because there's just one builder. So whether you're building landing pages or you're building pop-ups, tool tips, overlays, or doing web forms, uh, and part of our web forms is appointment scheduling, right? Appointment scheduling is a, a native part of active demand, which adds a lot of value to the sales organizations. And from a marketing perspective, we really, as marketers, we're working in campaigns. We have two campaign interfaces. One is a calendar. This is for doing promotions that have fixed dates and times on the calendar. This email will go up in this date and time. This email will go up in this date and time. We can schedule social posts, blog posts, et cetera. And the other campaign container, and this is really where we add a lot of value on the during the sales process is uh, our workflow-based or trigger-based campaigns. So when prospects do something or they meet some specific criteria, it can trigger a personal journey. Like for example, you follow me on Twitter, do I have your email address? Great, I'll start automating emails. If not, I'll auto automate direct Twitter messages or SMS and MMS, et cetera. Now, I'm just gonna show you this boundary again on the slide. So typically as marketers, we're doing lots of crazy things up here, um, but what's typically well-defined in an organization, like I mentioned, and should be well-defined, maybe it's not static, but it is well-defined, is what is it a prospect has to do to cross this boundary? And so, uh, and who do we need to send that to internally as a sales uh, in our sales organization? So the approach we've taken with Nimble with the integration is we abstract that boundary into a workflow. And really the idea here is whenever a prospect does anything, right, visits a website, fills out a forum, calls, books, a meeting, uh, whatever, uh, this workflow fires. And the intent of this workflow is to determine, is this ready for sales engagement or not? You know, if the lead score is high enough, great. If it's a form, uh, GOIP location, was it in Texas? Let's go tell the sales team in Texas about this and create the contact in Nimble, right? So this is actually, automated as part of a, a workflow. So we have very nice control as an organization to define that uh, uh, lead opportunity boundary. And then once we're in, in uh, Nimble, uh, one of the things that we have is this Chrome extension that uh, one is it tells us who's on our website and how people are engaging with our emails, et cetera. But we also add a data layer directly into Nimble. So this little badge here is green, and it's basically saying that this person's on my website right now. I can click it, see which pages they're visiting. I can make a call directly from here to auto log the call in Nimble. Um, we also have account insights, which shows us what all the rest of the people in that company have been doing on the website. And again, I can make uh, outbound calls, et cetera. So I'm just gonna pass things uh, uh, over to you just to talk a little bit about, uh, uh, um, about Nimble. All right, so you could think of Nimble uh, in terms of the, especially the integration with Active Demand. It's kind of like a dance. We will do the things that Active Demand can't do, and Active Demand does the things we can't do in a way where Nimble is main forte is contact management. That's the thing we excel at. And uh, just to show you real quick how easy it is to even organize your records, you know, you could be in a record and uh, you could set up your own set of data fields as a way to organize them. Uh, you have tags as well over here in Nimble, where you can tag records really quickly and just identify them as part of a group. For example, maybe, you know, you went for a conference, you met 20 people, and you want a way to identify that. You can basically tag them, like conference contact, go back to the tag over here, and Nimble will show you everyone who falls under that specific tag. Um, Nimble also is one of the only CRMs with the social media integration, and uh, we'll help you use Twitter or Facebook within Nimble itself, you can send Twitter DMs, Facebook DMs, you can have a status update and then schedule it for later. Uh, and on top of that, our email feature works a little different from how active demands work, where, where you can send marketing and big newsletter emails from active demand. With Nimble, you can send more personal emails. For example, I might wanna send an email and just send it to one person and track it. I can do that easily from Nimble. And I can also send a group message. Now, group message is not the same thing as a trip campaign or an email campaign. It's more personal because all emails that are sent from Nimble are sent from your own inbox. So at the end of the day, any emails that are sent from here will always reach the person's inbox. So this is 
you can use Nimble's group messaging feature for an email that's essential for everybody to read. Maybe it's a follow-up. Maybe you're asking for a particular thing that you need definitely open. That's when Nimble's group messaging feature comes in and we can definitely let you know whenever the email gets opened and how many people clicked on it, how many people didn't read it at all. And uh, that's a group messaging feature. Other than that, we have pipeline management and also task management. And uh, the best feature over here at Nimble is the ability to work everywhere you work. You know, For example, you could be in LinkedIn prospecting. Maybe you need to start working with the company over here and you see a couple of people you wanna add into your CRM. You don't have to copy and paste their name back into your CRM like you would normally do with your traditional CRM. But with Nimble, all you have to do is just hover over people's name. If there's a new record, Nimble will give you the ability to add them into Nimble over here. So Clint is not part of our CRM. I can just click add contact and he comes into my CRM over here. And I can even you know, ask Nimble to help me find an email for Clint right off the bat by just giving Nimble a first name, last name and a company name. And uh, that email will get saved over here in Nimble. And uh, then you can go ahead and start prospecting and doing the other things you need to do on the website you're on. You don't have to always, you know, completely distract yourself and open your CRM and go back to doing uh, whatever you were doing in your CRM. So I'll just uh, look for another record over here. Um, like, yeah, Michaela. Uh, Sometimes if people leave the company, it doesn't pick up the email, but if the person is a part of the company and the domain is a popular domain, it usually does uh, pick up the email. And at the same time, it'll also find any emails that's, you know, if you have a person already in your CRM, it'll just pull them up over here and then you can see their whole record over here, see any tags, see any lead fields or see anything else that you need to do with the particular record. And that's how Nimble basically works. The same feature will also work in Outlook and in uh, Gmail. So you can even use the same feature in your email accounts or in any other social media or any website. It basically works on top of your uh, browser. And yeah, there you go. Nimble did find uh, Michaela's email in that case, which just showed up. And yeah, that's how Nimble works. So I'll uh, leave it back to Sean okay. to finish it off. Yeah. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, so hope, again, so really the whole topic today was really, again, was the marketing and sales alignment. I think the right tools for the right job is, is an important decision, but if you're going to make the decision about getting tools, integration is absolutely a, a key aspect of this. Now, from sales and marketing alignment, again, we talked about uh, sales challenges. We talked about mail, uh, I should say, uh, marketing challenges. Uh, and it's important that the two teams understand the challenges that each of the different teams uh uh, are facing. We talked about the sales and marketing mix from a product complexity perspective. And uh, we definitely talked about the sort of what I call signal-based marketing uh, that happens during sales engagement where sale, the marketing folks can automate and help salespeople through, uh, through the buying process. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, our two solutions, hopefully you've seen today, are provide a very nice uh, coordinated uh, tool stack that helps with the sales and marketing alignment problem. And yeah.